Fujifilm Super Telephoto. We have the Fujifilm 200 f2 and Fujifilm's 100 to 400 4.5 to 5.6. Firstly, thanks so much for the support over the last couple of videos. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for your feedback and comments, and I hope they were beneficial. And secondly, those of you who are new to my videos, please do bear in mind that I am a Fujifilm ex photographer and ambassador of the brand. Obviously, I've chosen wildlife as the theme for this review, but please bear in mind that these lenses are suitable for sports, field sports, track sports, events, you name it. Uh, even portraiture to some degree, the 200 could definitely be used. Not that that would be the lens that you'd go to necessarily, but there's a whole host of types of shooting you could do with these two lenses. But the reason why I went with wildlife is that this is one area which I think I've used these two lenses more extensively than others. So I thought it fitting. And I think that a large percentage of people who are interested in this lens are wildlife shooters. So I'm hoping in this review you can sort of pick up what I'm saying and sort of translate it into different types of photography. I myself have used it in events, have used it in sports. So hopefully within this you can pick up ideas that you could translate into different types of shooting. Also just apologies, some of the words that I'm going to use in this review I may not be concentrating and I might use sort of a South African terminology which might be unfamiliar to you. We use words like uh, the bush is in, in sort of describing the environment. We don't normally use the word savanna or grasslands or things like that. We refer to as the bush or we don't really use the word wildlife that often. We normally talk about game or safari. We call, call it game drive. So going on a safari or a safari drive, we call it a game drive. So if I do use these words, I do apologize. It's just the way we brought up using these words is different to other people. Just to explain how wildlife fits into my photography job. I'm a portrait photographer. That's where I specialize. But twi roughly twice a year, um, wildlife or game gets mixed in with my portraiture. So I have two jobs that I do sort of middle of the year and then towards the end of the year where private people, certain people employ me uh, primarily as a portrait photographer, but to spend time in private nature reserves and uh, not only photographing them and the surroundings, but also the game. So the, uh, the, the fact that I can shoot a bit of game or know how to reasonably shoot it, I'm not claiming to be a wildlife photographer, is a bonus to them but obviously their their main focus is on me getting portraits and obviously not just portraits at the lodge portraits of them in the environment sometimes we're unfortunate to get game walking behind them we get off the vehicle if it's safe enough we get some beautiful shots shots that just aren't possible anywhere else so um, just to bear that in mind so those of you who are wildlife shooters um, I'm not a I'm not a full-time wildlife shooter now the areas that you're seeing photographs from is what's called the Kruger National Park in South Africa. The park is about the size of uh, Israel or Wales. So it's a large area. It's our largest national park. I mean, so many other countries like Canada and the United States have vastly larger national parks. But in Africa, it's one of, the, one of the largest parks. In South Africa, it's our largest park. It's one of the most successfully run parks in the world, if not the most successfully run parks in the world. I know that we, our rangers and so on advise parks all around the world on how to get it right. So we um, have a good reputation. It's a very well-run park. But the areas that I'm in are actually private parks that sit on the border. Yes, they are open to the Kruger, so the animals can fro uh, sort of flow freely from the main part of the Kruger into these areas. But it's what's known as the Sabi Sands. And the Sabi Sands is a collective of sort of private properties, um, lodges, hotels, and sort of the premium level uh, game experience or wildlife experience. But just to give you some context to what I do when I'm shooting, it's not my primary, primary focus. So those of you who are wildlife photographers, um, especially uh, fine art wildlife photographers, I'm very different in that sense, is that I'm, I'm actually photographing them in a documentary way. I'm photographing them very quickly. Because every day I shoot, when I get back to the lodge, and I shoot all the way up to the evening to drinks, whatever, I leave those people. I go and edit that whole day. I pick it and edit it. Has to be completed. The best shots of the day get put onto USB, and there's a screen in, generally in the lodges and straight away these guys are viewing their photographs the next morning when they wake up for the early morning game drive. So I operate till about 2 or 3 every morning if I can get my edit done quickly. And then I'm up at 5, 5.30 and I do this for a space of 4 or 5 days. So it's graft, it's hard work. Um, and so the edits on these photographs is what I've actually, I haven't gone and done more afterwards. These are how I edit them in, on my computer in the late hours of the night just to get them ready for the next day for the slideshow and also to put on there. So when I leave, I literally hand them the photos and they're gone. That's part of the deal. I wish I had more time because a lot of these photographs, I'd love to bring in a more fine art feel like darkening, dodge and burn, bring in the animal. You've got some lion head shots, you know, the stuff that you usually see. Maybe one day later on, I'll, I'll do that. But um, at this point, I consider myself just a documentary photographer when it comes to wildlife. 
And the reason why I bring that up is that it's so important for me to get shots as close as possible, correctly exposed in camera, correctly framed, and so on. And this plays a massive part in the equipment that I use, because I've got to turn it over so quickly, I've got to be very, very accurate. The thing about wildlife photography, this is all about location. This is all about having the means to get into those locations. If I hadn't have pref sort of done what I've done in my portrait work and got the attention of certain people, I wouldn't have been in this position. Not only just to photograph the game, but the cost of the money to get into those situations, even as a guest, is extremely high. Like South Africans, we live in this country. These are our animals. We don't get to see them. The average South African never gets to see them. Even those who consider themselves wildlife or game fundies will probably get into the bush maybe once or twice a year, three times a year. And they're going in on, into the main part of the Kruger National Park, which is tarred. There's some dirt roads. But you can't just turn left and head off through the, the bush right up to the leopard when you see it. I mean, a leopard, for example, in these private lodges, in one trip I could see three, four different leopards in one trip in a space of four or five days. That's about as much as I would see. A South African, if they see, as a person who sees game regularly, if they see a leopard once a year, they've done well. So I'm totally aware of, of the blessing that I have in this, these jobs that I do. I'm totally aware of the privileged position I'm in, not only just to photograph these people and the environments, but as a South African to enjoy that. So getting these type of shots, it's not delivered to me on a platter. Um, I still got to work really hard for them. And I've got to give them a professional product that they use me again in years to come so that I can repeat, repeat business. But at the same time, these private lodges offer photographers the ability to get shots that other people don't get. So when you're viewing my photographs, yes, it does require skill and knowledge and everything. But I also want to be honest that I was in a very fortunate position there. So a lot of wildlife people, I mean, we live in a, I live in an incredible country. Anywhere I look, I've got stuff to photograph. People who are watching this video may not be living in a particular town or country that doesn't have that sort of variation that we have. So a lot of what I'm able to do is also what I've been blessed with. So I want to make that pretty clear. Those situations I'm in, I've got no, I don't have that same level of pride as I would when I'm photographing a person, when I've set up a shot and I've got them to do stuff and I've turned it, I made an amazing photograph. There's something about the wildlife photography that's, it's humbling. Because the leopard being there at that right time when we came around the corner, seeing, an, seeing a kill of like either whether it's a, a lion or a, a leopard has, has hit a prey and it's, and it's just killed the prey and we got to photograph it. These things are not set up things. This is like, I'm fortunate to be here and I need to give it its respect it needs and I need to photograph it. So wildlife photography is very, very different to anything else. So when you see these photos, it's not a zoo environment. I don't have the animals on tap, but I have the, the most experienced rangers, trackers. The guys up front of that vehicle, those guys are like ninjas. I promise you, those guys can look at um, spur and they can look at tracks and they know t timing of the, tra the animal. They know which direction it's going. They know everything. And then they know how to find that animal within about 15 minutes because they know how far it is. They can look at a track and say, well, listen, there's no point chasing this animal because it's like down the road. Okay, we're going to start off with the 100 to 400. I consider this one of Fujifilm's most underrated lenses. Okay, yes, it's wild, widely used. Um, it's a fairly popular product to, to purchase. And I think one of its reasons for its being underrated is its speed. It's a 4.5 to 5.6 aperture throughout its focal range. And has very so it has a variable aperture. Just to explain how the variable aperture works, your widest aperture will change as you zoom out. So going from 100 to 400, you've gone from 4.5 to 5.6 as your widest possible aperture. All right. So the way it works is that the lens communicates with the body. So as as you're zooming in from 100 to 135 millimeters, you've gone from 4.5 to 4.7 to 200 mils. You've gone to f5. To 300 mils, you've gone to 5.2, and to 400 mils, you're going to 5.6. Very interesting, and this is where it communicates. If I zoom very quickly back to 100 or, or zoom back in, it automatically goes back to 4.5. So it remembers what your widest aperture was at any one of those focal lengths. So you don't have to worry about, like, okay, so you were at 4.5, you went out to 400, it was 5.6, you come back to 100, and it sits at 5.6. No, it doesn't. It always comes back. So you have that reassurance that when you're shooting wide open, it's as wide as it can at any focal length 
So a, a lot of wildlife is done with aperture priority. Uh, I may be wrong, but especially with the mirrorless body, you know, setting your auto ISOs and setting your minimum shutter speeds for very fast situations that happen in front of you, I find is a very quick way to make sure that you get exposure. And then all you're doing is you're using your exposure compensation dial and, and, and having this feature where it's always wide open all the time uh, does help considerably. So that's a really good feature. This lens does suffer from lens creep. It's pretty common in a lens this size. So you'll see, let's do that again for you. All right, you see how it just drops. So if you have this on a bolt clip when you get out of the vehicle or when you're walking around and it points down, you can guarantee the lens is gonna, it's gonna shift out like that. So what they've added is a locking mechanism. Now you can't lock it in its longest position, but you can lock it once it's fully uh, push back into the 100 mil position you can then lock it so now when you walk with it it doesn't drop out so i know some lenses have opted some brands have opted to do like a smooth and a hard transition in the zoom but you'll find that that hard transition doesn't lock it off so it's a lot of these lenses suffer from this lens creep but you can't lock it off so i think that's a very instead of them giving the option for a smooth or a, uh, a very stiff variation to the the extension I think this is a better solution. I don't really care how fast it moves when I'm shooting. It has no effect on my, on my actual picture that I'm taking. But what does have a, um, an effect is if I'm at 100, I lower my camera up to take a shot of maybe a wide and I want to get my other one back up again and I wanted to keep it at 100. All of a sudden I look through my viewfinder and it's fully extended and I've got to bring it back. So I like the feature of being able to, to lock it off. We have three switches. These are similar switches to what you find on other lenses, other Fujifilm lenses. On the right hand side, looking at from my position, you have the image stabilizer. All right, you can turn it on and off, which I'll also discuss in a short while. Then you have your aperture control switch. So you can go from an auto aperture. So if you were in shutter priority or you were prioritizing something else and not aperture, you would switch it here to auto. So the camera is working out your aperture for you while you are setting other parameters. Uh, I tend to shoot either full manual or aperture priority. So I'm always on um, aperture control where I like to have control over my aperture very quickly. Like many other lenses, Fujifilm has included on the 100 or 400 the full switch or the 5 minutes to infinity switch. If you were photographing something really close and then suddenly you decided that there's an animal far away and you want to focus on that, you've got quite a big focus turn there. So it might take a little bit longer than you'd hoped to go from focusing here to focusing here just purely because of that, that focal range that the camera has. By locking at 5 meters, it will focus on nothing closer than 5 meters, which is most of the time actually you don't really use this lens that much in these wildlife environments to get anything super close even in sports environments you don't really have a sportsman that close to you um, especially with a focal length like this so by locking it off the lens will only move between five meters and infinity which means that focus area is a lot a lot quicker so you'll get a better performance out of the lens with a lens of this reach and this focal length this is actually a very light lens and a very small lens um, it is a 4.5 to 5.6, so it's not the fastest, but I think the balance that you get between the aperture range and the weight of this lens is a good balance. Uh, I'll also get into why I don't see 4.5 as an issue or 5.6 as an issue, where some people would maybe hope for a, a faster lens. So I think it's a good balance um, of performance to weight and size. Uh, to carry around a lens that's just over a kilogram, that traditionally would have uh, sort of weighed a lot more than this, I find that is a massive benefit um, when you're out and about uh, shooting wildlife or sports and things like that. You, you can't, there's a, you have to put a value to that because if you, you know, on a vehicle and the vehicle's moving and you're bouncing, your hands holding the lens and you're trying to track something, I'm telling you what, that weight makes a massive difference, even just to steady off things. Just that balance, not too light, not too heavy, just a, a really comfortable weight to hold. Um, personally, I'm not a massive fan of lenses that extend. Uh, I've said this before in other reviews. I prefer internal mechanisms, but I think that it then again would have made this lens bigger. So I'm happy to accept that as a trade-off. This is the only plastic component that I can see. There's aspects of plastic here as well, but this main collar, this part of the section that joins the camera and the whole bottom section through the aperture ring and so on is all metal. And then just this part here to control the weight, because uh, it would have been too too heavy if they'd kept it all metal. They've gone with this sort of this sort of long end of the lens, the top, the tube end of the lens uh, made out of plastic. You have the tripod collar. Obviously has a locking mechanism, so it actually is a spinning collar, which is very handy. You've got a white mark at the top, so you always know where um, center is, and you're sort of turning to portrait mode as well. So what you can do is you can keep it partly locked, and if this is on the tripod, you can go from a landscape position quickly into a portrait position and keep shooting. 
um, which I think is super, super handy. I don't suggest you take this collar off very often because uh, these little screws go into little holes inside the lens and are quite um, finicky to get back. So I wouldn't take the collar off in a hurry. I'd keep it on. And, and you know, knowing that the lens is 100 to 400 uh, millimeters on an APS-C sensor, meaning in 35 millimeter equivalence terms, you're looking up to about a 600 mil lens. Overall, this is very manageable. It's easy getting out, in, out of vehicles. You're climbing on the those stands those off the real wheel. You're getting into this, the, the bush vehicle. And um, yeah, I just find it's such an easy lens to get around and it's so versatile. Fujifilm's XF 200mm f2 lens. This is as good as it gets for Fujifilm. This is what I would call their premium, premium lens. Yes, it's a particular lens. Yes, it has a certain focal length. Um, but from a build quality perspective, from an image quality perspective, from combining a long focal range or focal length, should I say, with a wide aperture, yeah, this is as good as it gets. Starting with the lens hood. Really solid lens hood. They've continued on the same um, sort of finish that the lens has right onto the lens hood. It's, it suits the lens beautifully. It does the job that it's meant to do. I mean, I don't know how much you can say about a lens hood. But one thing I do know that it is incredibly strong. It's got a nice locking mechanism. I haven't had any trouble with it. But I think part of the reason why it's such a successful lens hood in the sense that it uh, clips in very easily and locks off beautifully and you don't have to worry about it like you do with some lens hoods is because of the quality of this front element. This steel, this metal that they've used here is insane. This is, this is about as tough a front element as I've seen on, on any lens. Such amazing quality. Don't know if you can... Hear that on the microphone. That's solid. Talking about weight and size, yes, this is an incredibly heavy lens. All right, it comes in at about 4.9 pounds, about 2.2 kilograms, but you've got to put that into perspective. One of the perks of having a APS-C mirrorless system is that you have a compact system. Now, there's a lot of arguments out there to state, well, if you compare it to 35 millimeter mirrorless, well, there's not too much difference in the size because you've got to look for lenses that have slower apertures and 35 millimeter systems because the equivalent depth of field and so on and so forth. But a lot of those lenses then you go forced to compare with don't have the image quality of the one that you're comparing. Yes, your depth of field might be a stop out, your exposure isn't, but the actual image quality was meant to be compared with the top one. Um, so it's very difficult to get apples and apples comparison when you're trying to work out what is a more compact size lens. The great thing about this lens is that to please everyone, we have an apples for apples comparison. Canon and Nikon have their 300 2.8 lenses. Um, 300 mil from a field of view equivalence and 2.8 from a depth of field equivalence. Those lenses, the smaller one out of the two is actually the Canon and the Canon comes in at around uh, about 2. Point, sorry, 26 centimeters, 260 millimeters in length, around three kilograms in weight. This comes in at 20 centimeters, 200 mil in length, which is actually a little bit shorter than the 100 to 400 and comes in at 2.2 kilograms. So this is around two thirds of the size of the 35 millimeter equivalent that's out at the moment. Not to say that they will perfect that and with their mirrorless make it an even smaller lens, I don't know, but this is a good uh, factor, or at least, at least this is a reason in factoring this camera in when it comes to wildlife. If you're looking for a very compact system that has that balance between its size, weight, and its image quality that, or at least the one that uh, the APS-C sensor and the Fujifilm cameras produces, I think this is a really good choice to make. Just going down the lens, just explaining the different features. Again, as mentioned before, really solidly built, durable front element. You have focus buttons found on the lens itself, so you can use those as focus buttons as opposed to actually using the body of the camera, so you can be pulling it and focusing there. It's well equipped, it's got four buttons, so you can be a left-hand shooter, a right-hand shooter, you can go from landscape to portrait, and your thumb will always, and your finger, your index finger, whatever finger you use, is always gonna find a button. So well thought out. Beautiful focus ring. It's quite, quite a long focus, um, I wouldn't say throw, I don't know what the word you'd use for it. Uh, from going from its closest point to infinity if you're doing video, which is not really a video lens this um, You can do it. You can use it for video. You might Yeah, manual focus is going to be tough. The autofocus is I think would be the way to go because you're going to have to do a lot of turns to get it from closest point to infinity Then moving down to your aperture ring solidly built aperture ring beautiful same sort of finish going right across the aperture ring You can hear those clicks between we go again Either on the microphone Really, really beautiful. F2 to F22. Um, and then going on to your switches here. Uh, 
Just like the 100 to 400, I'll start at the top here. It's got a fooled or a five meters to infinity, which obviously controls that focus area. You're on and off for your IOS, your OIS, which is your image stabilizer, your sort of focus um, settings. So you can lock your focus by locking it. You pull focus, hit the switch to autofocus lock, and your distance will be kept not changed so in some situations you're static you're either on foot and you've now stopped or your vehicle has stopped so your distance to subjects not going to change you've got an animal that's pretty still it's taking a while for something to happen well you know you want to stretch or you want to get something out your bag or you want to do something you want to look away just to have sort of get your bearings to see if you're not missing something else because you're so focused on this one moment well you know that if something happens goes back as soon as you lift the camera and fire you don't have to focus and pull focus again. You've got that lock, so that's a really cool feature. A lot of the lock feature, autofocus locks are found on the bodies. It's just nice to have it on the lens because your thumb is, you know, your focus, if you're gonna focus with the lens and you know, hit these switches, everything's easily uh, ex uh, sort of accessible and you can learn with your, your hand where these all are. They're easy to sort of, I picked it up pretty quickly. Then you've got, I'll go to the outside first, the other side is autofocus. Um, you just keep it on that if you want genuine autofocus all the time, which is just a usual pulling when you hit your shutter button, whatever button you, where you back focus or if you use the focus buttons here, you have to have that switched on to be able to use that feature, which is your usual feature. Then you've obviously got the preset button. Now the preset button allows you to set a focus point. So by setting it, with, which is the lowest button here, so let's just say for example, I'm photographing, something of interest there. Um, again, it's a lying animal, nothing's happening there, but there's something happening over there with some other animals. Well, I can lock off that point, go shoot away here, and then hit that, other, hit that button as soon as I move back and then remember that one, and it'll actually lock it off on that point. So you can actually set in, in a memory a focal distance, which is very, very cool, very, very handy. Didn't use it a lot, but the times that I did use it, it came in handy. Definitely, and it's something you've got to remember because you're just so used to pulling focus. You go, oh, I don't have to do that because you, you, you'll you be going between, going, oh, oh, oh. just lock off one, shoot away, and then the corner of your eye, you can shoot with one eye, you can see movement, go and shoot straight away. So very cool feature. The tripod collar. This is different to the tripod collar found on the 100 to 400. It's a lot more sturdy because the lens is a heavier lens, but it's not a removable one. It doesn't have little screws where you can take it off. It rotates as well does the same thing so you can go from a landscape to a portrait very easy. But what's really cool, instead of having that line that you've got to actually line it up to get it square again, it's got locking points. So it actually clicks when it hits lock, lock, and then you can go anywhere in between and you can lock it off. So I think that's really cool. So very quickly you can square it off for a landscape shot. Also to note, you can have your strap on the lens itself, you can connect a strap. So if you were carrying with a strap, you don't want that weight of that lens pulling on the body mount. And this is around your neck. Obviously I use a Spider Pro belt, so my connection's on there and it sits like that. Well, you can't see in the video, but it sits on the belt there. So that's very easy for me, but those are using straps. This is where you would be connecting it to your strap. And then lastly, um, very cool, is that they've actually got this dovetail on the actual uh, foot of the tripod mount. So that means those of you who've got those tripods where your the teeth of the locking mechanism where the plate is come in, you don't need to use your plate anymore. You don't need to add a plate to this and then put it on your tripod. This thing will be your plate, it'll lock in. So it'll function like the current plate that you have. So it's like a built-in plate. So you have the option of adding another plate or using this plate. And I think that's a really, really cool feature. You know, obviously the glass is incredible. Nice, nice wide opening in the front that's a, 100 mil opening because that's how you would work out your widest aperture. You've got a 200 mil by 100 mil opening tells you that it's an f2 lens. The actual finish of this lens is incredible. It's got like a, it's not a rubberizer, but it's got like a rubber, it's got like a, a textured paint. Kind of adds like a bit of like when I hold it, the lens is not going to slip out my hand. It, like, you know, it's not like a sweat, you know, because you've got so much weight. If you're sweating and it was that shiny metal, it would just drop out your hand. It, it just, it's, it's just, yeah, it's a well thought out lens, just solidly built, really, really. It gives you a lot of confidence when you're shooting with it. You know that you're dealing with a, a real tool, like a really well built tool. So looking at these lenses, they're not really in competition with one another. They're very different lenses. In fact, I think they actually complement each other more than anything else. Um, I find by taking both of me into the bush, I, I, they, both, they both help me in different ways. Like one is not more important than the other. That's why making a decision when you're going into, into buying lenses for wildlife is going to be incredibly tricky because the obvious is, oh, F2, I've got the money, I can pay for it. Let me tell you, this 100 to 400 is an underestimated lens. Its versatility 
when, when you're in static positions, which you are in a vehicle, is just so important. So, so important. So I'll give you an example. On the vehicle, you're on the move. Sometimes things just happen. So like um, Impala, which are very common back, uh, antelope, we call them back, um, often just get spooked or triggered and then they just take off. And what happens is, is that they start to go into sort of a jump. And then these back are incredible. They can actually jump around 10 meters, 30, 33 feet or so in distance from one jump. Just like, they're like spring loaded. And as soon as the one jumps, they all just go into sort of a jumping motion. Um, so in some, some situations, you don't realize that something's being stalked and you haven't seen it yet. You come around the corner and next thing the, the back are off or they've been spooked by you or whatever. I've always got my lens up ready to shoot. You don't have it by your face because you'll probably lose your teeth with the car bouncing around everywhere while you, or the 4x4 bouncing around. Don't do that. Keep it away from your face. But by having that wider focal length, you have a better starting point. When you have a fixed focal length, it's very difficult to find the shot. So you can see it with your eyes, but as soon as you lift up to actually find what you're looking at, especially if you're on the move, which is almost impossible, but even when you're not on the move, that 100 wide, you see it in your viewfinder, and then you pull it and you get it. You, you can't put a value to that. So like these back are running, and I can see them through the bush because we're running parallel to them, and I'm trying to get the jumps, and as we're going, as we're going, it's very, very difficult. I just start off on that 100, I watch with my eye, as soon as I get that moment, I bring the camera up, I find the back that I'm trying to get, and then I zoom in to get the shot. That's all very quickly. So that, that wide start allows me to get a good starting point, and then the zoom allows me to focus in. The 200 is not built for that. So there's an example. So not only would the 100 to 400 be an option here, like if you were looking at the 200 as your longest focal length that you need, you wouldn't need a 400. Well, you could go the 50 to 140 route and get the 2.8 as your sort of your go-to lens, your versatile lens, the lens that's going to get you most, most sort of shots, and you can put the extender on that, by the way, as well, which will take it up even further. And then when you get into those static situations where you're watching game, where you, you're picking up on a bird or something that's still in front of you, or even something moving, like I do have moving shots, but, but very importantly, you're static and you're in a position to start tracking from the beginning when you've already found what you're going to be photographing, that's when the 200 F2 comes into its own, and it's a totally... It's an unbeatable lens when you're comparing these two. Um, but I will say that the image quality of the 100-400 is incredibly impressive. I always think of slow lens. This is what I like about Fujifilm is that their slow lenses perform well. A lot of other manufacturers, when they give you slow lenses, they also, okay, we're going to give you a bit of a cheaper lens and they kind of downgrade the quality. I like that even slow lenses in the Fujifilm lineup, yes, they're slow, but they're not, they don't get downgraded in quality. And this 100 to 400 has impressed me from 100 to 400. Again, I've used, I've used lenses. Trust me, I've used them. I'm not going to tell you all the brands that I've used. I used one particular brand for years. And, and the equivalent in this to that, uh, the 100 to 400 equivalent, even though the, the, the field of view is different, it, it might be sharp wide, but not going to be that sharp at 400 or vice versa. The, there was always, there's just issues. You just know that from 100 to 400, bang on image quality, you don't have to worry like back off a bit to get the better image quality, you've got it all the way through 4.5 to 5.6, listen, in, in sporting environments, daytime field stuff, and then you move into sort of evening, evening sporting stuff, I can see where the slow aperture might be an issue and you might want to look at the 200 then in those situations or even the extender on the 50 to 140 just to get that uh, faster aperture, I understand that, um, but when it comes to wildlife, I really felt no drawback from having a 4.5 to 5.6. Most of the drives are in daytime. You see better game. Most, I think most of the better shots are done sort of in the daytime. Yes, they are early morning and late afternoon because you start your drives at 5.30 and you're done by like 8 or 9 and then you have breakfast and then you're out again. You don't go in the midday because the animals are all sort of, they're hidden, they're sleeping, they're lying down on the grass. You can't see them. It's too hot to be out and about. You might get some animal at the watering hole, but the, the light's very harsh. So you head back out at three o'clock. So you're dealing with that sort of early morning light. So yes, you could deal, do with a slightly faster aperture, but with the image stabilizer, a lot of the shots I'm getting, we come across the corner, here's an animal standing there. I can even go down to 1 25th of a second with a five stop image stabilizer on the 100 to 400, um, shooting at like, even if it's low morning light at 1200, 1250 ISO or 1600 ISO, and I get the shot. And I, I haven't felt it as a drawback. It hasn't really been an issue for me. The 200, um, is incredible for when it just goes beyond that light where you're just getting that beautiful twilight and and you just you're battling sort of going lower than 60th of a second at 400 with the other lens or maybe even 200 you know that 
the 200 mil lens really does uh, come into its own in those situations because you're talking at about you're talking at just over uh, you're looking at two stops of light more so that's the difference between shooting a 1600 ISO and um, 400 ISO so you can see that's a big difference so that is a, that is its main thing and then combined it, it, it's sharp wide open it's sharp at f2 you could shoot that lens all the time at f2 and never change it and it's incredibly sharp incredible quality and I will say as well that the bonus to the 200 and I'm glad that they added it in especially when you're paying that much for a lens they give you a solid bag with it which is really nice nice padded bag um, built for the lens itself but not only that in the top of the bag you get an extender so you're getting a 1.4 extender which I used quite regularly I do find using a battling a battle a lot on the vehicle when I'm out and about and I'm trying to use an extender it's quite difficult you, you're kind of trying to shoot and you, you don't want the dust in your lenses you don't want to be taking lenses off that often you want because I shoot with uh, often with maybe two or three bodies so I've got a wide lens that's permanently on one body like on my oldest X-T2 and then I've got the two X-T3s with the 100 to 400 or the 50 to 140 and then I've got either one of these lenses on the other depending on what I'm shooting and I don't want to be taking lenses off so the extender does help the 200 but just bear in mind that you're going to be taking your lens off quite often and there's nothing worse than there's a moment going to happen and you kind of caught between should you use it or not so when you do need it and you have time to use it these are incredibly helpful and it doesn't affect image quality the image quality that you get at 280 mils because that's what it effectively does with the 1.4 teleconverter um, is incredible so hats off to Fujifilm for including this one of the less obvious things about shooting wildlife with telephoto lenses is the angle that you're shooting them at so what happens is that if you arrive at a viewing and you're in the vehicle you perch quite high so what happens with the animals is that as they move closer to the vehicle you tend to want to having to have to shoot down on them because you can start sort of getting your wider focal lens out and you shoot it as it walks past the vehicle but what I find is that all of those type of shots they don't work as well because they give the viewer the impression that you're no longer part of the scene you, you're standing on something photographing down you could be in a zoo you could be anywhere and it just disconnects the viewers but when the animal's just far enough that sort of the, the level of you and that animal are almost on the same plane or the animal sits a bit higher or even just slightly lower and it, they don't know that you're on a vehicle that you could be anywhere you could be on foot in the bush as well so that is an important element to shooting wildlife I just find that those telephotos like I'd rather have my, my vehicle not getting too close around a sighting I'd like them to step back just a little bit so I can get sort of more flat on obviously there's certain situations where you've got to shoot down like there's a leopard shot that I did where the leopard was in like a trench and was lower than us and I had to shoot down and it worked out well because he looked up at me and the angle was just about borderline where I don't want it to go too low and that's what these type of lenses give you they give you that ability to fill the frame with the animal but yet not be right next to the animal and those work I think the best uh, out of the different game shots that you do obviously you can still do those sort of fine art shots with wide big skies elephants at the bottom small black and white and things like that so that's just one idea but it's important to note that um, especially with the 100 to 400 to be able to get an animal at a really far distance and fill that frame with it uh, which is equivalent to 600 mils on the 35 millimeter uh, system um, yeah you can't put a price to that I mean it's the viewer has no, no idea how far you are from that animal um, and just that level plane across picking up the grass and the foreground out of, sort of the out of focus areas um, yeah it's really really impressive another thing to mention is the apertures on these two lenses obviously the f2 is going to give you a shallow depth of field but what is interesting is that even though the perception is that 4.5 to 5.6 is incredibly slow you'll be surprised that when you start getting out to the long focal lengths how narrow your depth of field is when you're shooting at 5.6 or 4.5 even you're shooting on the 100 to 400 at 200 mils and you're shooting at f5 which would be its widest aperture at that focal range and you're then taking the same shot with the 200 mil f2 the f2 will probably at about 90 feet from the subject give you around two meters area of focus and the uh, 200 mils at f5 is going to give you like four meters now that sounds like half the distance but when you're taking a picture from quite a distance it's not as obvious that that fall off is double um, what the wider aperture is giving you it's not that obvious um, so don't get too caught up on wide apertures from the sense that these long long lenses even at 4 4.5 to 5.6 in used in certain ways can give you really shallow depth of field then on the other hand if you bring in stuff that's really really close with the 100 to 400 and you're shooting it at at the 100 mil at 4.5 or even at the 400 at 5.6 you can really get a short area you can get like 
like like I think about 10 centimeters and 14 centimeters or something like that. So maybe about that much you can get in certain situations I find where in those situations the 200 F2 gets so shallow it's like half a centimeter from the same distance uh, to the point where actually the image is not usable. So because there's just too much animal behind that focus point. So yes, F2 is amazing. Don't, don't get me wrong, F2 is amazing. To be able to isolate the subject like that. So there's many shots I've been able to get where the animal is just beautifully positioned. Um, the animal is a little bit too close in color to the background. So with a larger depth of field in those situations, the animal blends into the grass behind because like, for example, a leopard, it's very close in color often to the savanna grass, to the bush, the bush felt. It blends in too much. And then what that, what that 200 F2 does is that it creates that separation from a shallow, with a shallow depth of field that it doesn't really matter that there's that similarity in color. It's so obvious that that animal stands out um, and separates itself. So in the situations where that 200 mm lens is just incredible. Often it's static scenes. I can got time to frame and wait for the animal to move into position. Boom, you get the shot. It's, it's just amazing when you get those results back and you look how sharp that image is. And it, it's mad to think that it's an APS-C sense and it just performs so well. One of these situations, we were at a watering hole and there was just uh, wild dog pups around, little ones. And they're all sizing each other up. You know, in the, in the wild, it's, those youngsters are all, you know, vying for a pecking order in the, in, the, in the pack. So they're all trying to, you know, take each other out, bite, uh, fight, and they're all learning their skills on how to hunt and fight and so on. So these guys were in the watering hole in shallow water and they're looking at each other and they're biting each other and they're chasing each other. A lot of fun to watch. And there were situations where I was tracking uh, those pups just running across the edge of the water and the lens just got focused every shot. Just boom, 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 boom. Like I didn't have to worry. I was on continuous focus. F2 the whole way. So, was, you know, to pull focus with such a shallow depth of field, not, you know, a lot of lenses battle with that and it just held focus. And it's just a premium, premium product. It's such an incredibly well-built precision tool. As a part of the Kruger National Park, there's massive waterways that come through. So you can be there in certain seasons and it's bone dry. They're literally having a drought, animals are dying. And then the rain suddenly comes and it you know, comes in from different catchment areas. And you've got these massive riverbeds that could be like maybe a few hundred meters wide. And you can see where the water levels were before and they can be as high as sort of like five to 10 meters like up to 20, 20 to 30 feet from the base of the river up to where the embankment comes. So you can just imagine in a short space of time, that area just flooding with water and that's how much water comes through there. So incredible to see. But nevertheless is that when they're dry, sometimes you can't get across or you can't get through or whatever and the animals are often sitting on the, the sort of the sandbanks with inside these riverbeds and there's things between you. Um, there was a situation where is, we didn't see the actual kill happen, but we, we think that the lions chased the giraffe. What happened is the giraffe got too close to the, the edge of the river and has taken a tumble down because they've almost forced it to do so. Probably broke its leg or maybe even its neck as it came down, but it came down into very shallow water in the river, ba in the river basin. And here's a photograph and we saw it by chance. We we're just driving down and someone looked to the left and saw it. And right through the trees in this little gap here, you see this lion just standing next to this and he's just eating the eating the giraffe and the 100 or 400 got it. The next situation we're driving along, same thing, it was a riverbank and we we're really low down below us so we didn't initially see it but as we came around the corner we noticed some elephants drinking at the water and there was a bit of water flowing through it but they were trying to get to the other side so they started drinking and playing around and got some shots and then they started going across and I got this beautiful scene of the family going across with the matriarch in the front and the little baby is holding mom's tail as they go across the, the water, which is a, a beautiful sight to see. And the 100 or 400, I wouldn't have been able to get, I mean, that's not a crop shot, that is the full shot. And I'm far away, I can't even explain how, how far I am from that scene. And I was able to get it at 5.6, nice and sharp. It's such a, it's, yeah, I, I just, I'm really grateful that I was able to use those lenses in those situations, but the 200 couldn't do that. Even with the extender, it would have taken me up to 280 mils, and it would have only been, you can imagine that shot being half as, half as tight, maybe about half as wide. It would have lost the impact. I would have had to crop in two times crop in post-production just to frame it the same way. There was a situation where I was photographing a, a leopard sort of late into the afternoon or early evening where they started to have to take out the lights um, off the vehicle. The track up front holds a spotlight. Uh, they don't, certain animals you're not allowed to really put it straight in the eyes, some of them because it could blind them for a while and then make them vulnerable to prey. 
So they, they, they know which animals to do it and sometimes just to the side. But leopard, you can kind of go on its body. Um, so when we arrived, there was just enough light. And the natural reaction was to get as close as we can. And the leopard was above us in the tree and was sort of hanging over the tree, just sort of lying there. Um, it had a kill a little bit, a little bit further down on the branch, but it wasn't eating. It was just chilling out, big, nice tummy on it. I wanted to get this on the, the 200 F2 because the light was going down and I wanted a clean as possible image. And I just wanted that beautiful shallow depth of field on its face. And with the wider, with the wider f field of view, I, we had to go in closer. But the closer we got to the leopard, the more the leopard was above me directly. We were forced to have to drive back and then photograph at a sort of lower angle to be able to get more of that leopard in the tree. So there's an example where because I was able to go back, I was able to use the zoom feature, uh, the range that the 100 to 400 has to get the exact shot that I wanted. You know, just because it's a F2 lens or it's a premium product doesn't mean you get the shot. I would 100% recommend the 100 to 400 irrespective of budget because it's such a versatile lens. Like if I look at all the images I come back with from, from wildlife, I'll probably have a third with the 200 and I'll have two thirds done with the 100 to 400 that are in like what I give to my clients, they, the, the keepers, if you want to call it that. It's just because it's going to get you a lot more. So if you can afford both, you have the, the sweet spot there. But that's not, a, that's not accessible for everyone. Not everyone can afford, not even just the one lens, definitely not the two lenses. But I know there's some of you out there who could do that. Both lenses are image stabilized and they're rated around five stops. Now I've used the, both these lenses with the X-T3 and the X-H1. I never saw any additional benefit of using the in-body stabilizer in the X-H1, um, but I'm not 100% sure what the X-T4 will do with these two lenses. Um, if it stays at the uh, sort of rated five stops or if it will give you the additional stop, which some lenses are able to get. But what I will tell you though, is if you are doing any panning or tracking, sort of left to right, moving left to right in, in the scene, my recommendation is to turn off the stabilizer on the lens because it is very, very powerful. And what it does is it tries to grab the pan as you're moving left to right or right to left. And it's very difficult to track whatever you're trying to photograph. Now, supposedly these lenses are, have a built-in function which helps with panning with the stabilizer, but I just prefer to turn it off altogether. But in any, any other situation when you're using the stabilizer, both are incredible. We're currently in the lockdown. And for those of you only seeing this video years later, it's the COVID-19 2020 lockdown. And I feel really bad because all the images in this review were from previous shoots. And I really like to give you sort of up-to-date shoots with these products that I review. So I took the 200mm lens and the 100 to 400mm lens around my home. And I got some shots and I put a little video together for you. So before I play that video to end off this video, I firstly want to thank you for your time and support. I really do appreciate it. I hope this was beneficial to you. If you like what you see here, please, you're more than welcome to visit my channel and view some of my other videos where I've done tutorials and reviews. Like, subscribe, all much appreciated, and take care and God bless. Party, grab, fiesta, forever. Come on and sing along. We're going to party. Uh, guys, can you not see I'm trying to photograph a rock pigeon? Mom said we had to play outside. Well, um, I'm the boss and I'm telling you you can go watch TV. Uh, just don't tell mom I said that. We better go with rock pigeons anyway. Yeah, I heard that. Come pigeon, pigeon, pigeon. Pigeon sound. No, 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 not that one, not that one. No cats, no cats, no cats, definitely no cats. Stop, 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 stop. No, go away. Go away. Finally alone. Just Lionel and I. Stuck on you. Got this feeling down deep in my soul that I just can't lose. Guess I'm Come on my I don't way. know what's more ridiculous. You're singing or you thinking you're the boss.